I'm going to start it out in a reverse order. Maybe Michael, one thing we didn't talk about, and again, any questions on anything infection related, please come to the mics. We didn't talk a lot about through this whole thing about timing on a two stage exchange. We obviously, and we didn't talk anything about one stage. So a couple of questions here. Let's just do timing. I think we all agree on it. Maybe just give the group our overall kind of Mayo timing on resection, reimplantation, when we're getting labs, what we're getting. So on. On my patients, they're going to get, you know, typically six weeks of IV antibiotics. We've got some trials for certain organisms with uh, oral medications. We can talk about that more. And then typically I'm going to wait a full six weeks after that. And that's pa partially because of the schedules are so crazy right now. And I don't want to bring somebody back and have their labs up a little bit and um, have to go ahead and find a new date. Usually by four weeks or so, or 10 weeks or so, the labs are fine, but I've been putting them out to a, a full three months. Uh, typically, I'm gonna get the labs set rate in CRP, the time the antibiotics are done, three weeks later, and then right before they come in for their reimplantation. Good, I think that's kind of a standard for, standard for our group. Other comments from the partners? We're all at Mayo, obviously we do very similar. Maybe just one, uh, you know, often when you're putting these non-articulating knee spacers in and hip spacers, but it's often the big disasters like these guys showed. And so there's no harm in waiting even longer. So if it's, you know, a, an infection that's been difficult to control or a multiply failed two-stage exchange, it's okay to push them out four, five, even six months, really make sure that knee quiets down, their inflammatory markers are normal before you reimplant them. I think that's a good point, Kevin. I tell them it's a minimum of three months, three plus, just in case something gets a little funny on the labs or atypical ones, which we oftentimes wait six months. Uh, Tad, then Raf. Yeah, just uh, really quick on the timing. I think it's a little bit like we talked about in the diagnosis thing with that fourth arrow, uh, kind of go back to the beginning. I think one of, in my opinion, one of the worst things you can do sometimes is if you've got a schedule for that reimplantation and they come in and it's a mixed picture, Yep. labs are a little off, wound looks a little so-so. I think there are some folks that would say, well, if they don't look perfect at you know six weeks out from antibiotic stop, I'm gonna take them back to the OR and do a spacer exchange. I think you might be jumping the gun mm -hmm. on a lot of those patients. Just give it time, wait a month, wait six another six weeks. Um, a lot of times that'll clarify itself. If they're still infected, things are gonna look worse in a month. If they weren't infected, it's gonna look better, in which case you're not gonna subject that patient to another operation in a highly morbid treatment course. So. Uh, don't underestimate the power of just sort of giving things time on the on the replants. And Tad highlights something that we, the reason we do an antibiotic holiday is for that exact purpose. We want it to declare itself as good or it's failing before you go in and on a knee, usually cemented on a hip, put something in that's going to get ingrowth pretty quick. Raf, you were going to make a comment, please. No, the exact same comment, actually. So Perfect. Rob, Rob please. Yeah, you know, I'm maybe a little slower than the, than the rest of the folks. Yep. If I've got a patient comes back at three months, the x-ray looks pristine. My prostate either in the hip or the knee looks the bone. Some interfaces look fine. The patient's infection-free and pain-free. I'm not giving that patient an operation. You know, I cannot make a patient who's pain-free, infection-free better. Now, different if they're young and they got an interface that's breaking down. Okay, yeah. then I don't tell that patient they need surgery. But the interface looks perfect. They're infection-free and they're pain-free. I'm telling that patient I'll see him again in, you know, three to six months. And uh, if they have pain, get off it and uh, we'll reimplant. But got to be careful with that if you got a loose implant and often the sockets are loose. Yep. That's right around you lose a little bit of bone. So I'll only do that if I got a, you know, good looking x-ray. Yeah, you want to cause more problems. It's got to look perfect. Right here, please. So recently in the literature, you guys have talked about more primary exchange. And I've done that now based on the literature. But yeah. you guys didn't talk about that. Is that still in favor? Are you going backwards? Or how do you walk that tightrope and make that decision? Good question. I'm going to start with Dr. Sierra Raff. Maybe a comment on, you're talking about one stage exchange, right? Maybe a comment on one stage exchange. Just real big picture when you do do it. I know you do some. Yeah. And kind of wh where the data is at right now in North America. I mean, I, I think that I would say that in North America, uh, I think the tide is somewhat shifting. Um, we're waiting for some important data to come out from North Carolina on their one stage versus two stage exchange. Similar patients, you know, they're not selected patients like, that, and that's been the problem with some of the data is that it's selected. Like you do it on selected patients, I'll do it on selected patients, probably the, the ones that have the, high, the least risk of failure. But that data is going to be very good. And so I think that, you know, I, um, Tom Faring uh, could not present at the Academy this past uh, specialty day, and I was able to give his talk. And so he has, I think he had about three patients still to enroll in the study before he could start looking at the data. I do think that 
if you look at the data from Europe at one stage exchange, uh, precisely the endoclinic data, they also are somewhat selective, although they're a little bit more aggressive with the resection and the debridement, and they'll take out everything. I mean, I've, I've heard them say, I mean, if in the case of infection, don't spare nerves, don't spare arteries, you know, just a tumor resection. That's something that we're not. That's called amputation, not, right? Uh, That's called an amputation, right? <laughs> well, it could be, but I mean, <laughs> so I would say that if you are going to be that aggressive, then you're, you're uh, and they will do hinges, obviously, for knees, right? So they will take down all the collateral ligaments, whether it's a 15-year-old or a 90-year-old, they'll do the same resection. So they will do a tumor resection, and in their hands, the results have been good. But the published data from their institution has also selected patients because they've also, the published data is based on organisms. So they, for example, they've excluded sometimes MRSA and other in, uh, types. So, so I do think that I would, I, before I say all into this, I think that we have to be very careful. Let's wait for Tom Faring and their, his group's data and see what the benefits are for the one-stage exchange. I do have to say that I do think that there's a rule for it. I do think that there are select patients that have uh, organisms that are susceptible to IV antibiotics, potentially susceptible to oral antibiotics, that are probably better treated from an economic as well as um, you know, decreasing two surgeries for them, the morbidity of two surgeries, I do think that the one-stage exchange will have a role in our future treatment of infection. Rob, you were going to make a comment. I would just highlight to you that it's got to be a susceptible bug, good host, good wound. So, and the, those in Europe, those are aggressive surgeries. So just take it with a grain of salt until we get some more contemporary data on different cohorts. Rob, please. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I think it's, it's reasonable to do. In a selected patient, it's a good bug. The data is known. I mean, good data from the UK and, and Europe that those patients, eight out of ten times, you're going to cure the uh, infection. But if you start pushing the indication, I don't think, at least in the United States, 2022, it's reasonable in selected patients. But you've got chronic infection, bad bugs, unknown bugs, then it's uh, you're opening up a can of worms. Yep. Paul, please. Uh, sort of a related question on single stages, specifically in patients' early post-op infections, cementless total hips, where oh, the good components uh, aren't well fixed. Um, I've taken to doing single stages in those patients. Uh, I think the debridement is much, much better than you do than you get with a dare. Is that something that you guys have experience with also? Well, Paul, it's a good question. Let me just clarify for the group and get it to the, to the virtual audience. We're not talking about a one-stage exchange in the acute setting. What we're talking about is a really aggressive irrigation debridement when you're not just doing a headliner, but you're actually doing a femoral and ass tablet component. So yeah. I, I like that thought process as well. Kevin, maybe you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I have some experience doing that. I think it's a great idea. I mean, it's easy to get the implants out. You start from scratch. You wash out the wound thoroughly, you know, get rid of anything in there. Uh, so I've had actually very good experience with that uh, early on and taking the implants out. It's harder on the knee side, right, where you've got cemented implants uh, the large majority of the time, although I think we're seeing more and more cementless yep. implants going in there too. Uh, but I think that's a great idea. Be as aggressive as you can. I mean, you're not going to kick yourself for taking those implants out and putting new ones in. I think you might kick yourself if you had the opportunity to do that and didn't. Yeah, and the reason we do a modular junction exchange is because you've got a junction exchange. And so if they're not ingrown, that's kind of the thought process and also taking out acetabular femoral components, or as Kevin said, if you've got uncemented knee components that we're seeing more often. Yeah, so uh, Go ahead, one point, yeah, so there's, uh, as, long, as far as I'm aware, there's one paper published from the combined case, a combined series by Jay, Parvizi, and I think Craig, that showed about a 67% success rate of that, so, so essentially a one-stage cementless exchange for an acute infection. The problem with that is no better than a dare, at least if you look at the average, so... Um, so I would say, so in my hands, if I have a patient where I'm thinking that a dare is not going to work, even if they have cementless implants, and I think that the, maybe the bacterial burden is very high, which would make me believe to take these implants out, I actually put a Prostolac, and I've actually come back at its later date, usually after they finish their IV antibiotics, and I'm able to put in primary implants as well. So essentially it's a two-stage exchange. Instead of doing it at, at once, you give them at least some chance with IV antibiotics with the prostate in place. Okay. Question here. 
Yeah, to piggyback on the earlier discussion on timing, can you talk about your reimplantation cutoffs and trends and what like a reaspiration looks like for you guys? But, Tad, can you take this one? So what do we what do we get here? And I don't know, they're not normal, but they're looking okay. Kind of your trends that you're looking for? Yeah, so no, that's a great question. I think partly you have to look at every, indip every patient indi individually, of course, but I think in general, um, as was discussed earlier, you're gonna have the data from your pre-resection, so you're gonna have a sort of a call it a baseline infected sed rate CRP. You're gonna get another set right at the antibiotic stop. And what you wanna see, of course, is that even if it hasn't come down to normal, you wanna see it trending the right direction. And then again, if they look perfect at six weeks, let's say when they stop their IV antibiotics, I myself usually don't check them again until right before I'm gonna reimplant them unless there's a clinical change. If they don't look perfect, then I'm probably gonna get those interval labs, kind of like Dr. Taunton mentioned, get them at two weeks post antibiotic stop and then four and then six. But really what you want to not see is that sort of V where they come down on treatment and then go back up. Sometimes it's equivocal, and that's where I will wait more time. So I'm gonna wait another month. I mean, unless it's obvious that they're reinfected, I'm gonna give it more time. I do not think there's a role for routine re-aspiration before reimplantation. That's been looked at a lot of different ways, and it tends to be pretty unreliable. So that's pretty rare. Um, oftentimes what I'm gonna do that is if I'm, I'm waiting, waiting, it still looks kind of funny, and it's an articulating spacer then I might re-aspirate them, but uh, otherwise it's, it starts to be a little hit or miss. Yeah. Yep, pretty rare for us. Let's take a question from here. We got about eight minutes, so keep the questions coming. Right here, please. A uh, question on the DARE. If you have an uh, obvious acute uh, infection, uh, is it reasonable to wait three days after culture so you know what you're dealing with to know what the uh, you know, success rate is gonna be for your DARE? Yeah, thanks for the honest question. So just to repeat it is, do you wait for your cultures on a DARE or do you go back in and then get them after? Uh, let's, Rob, let's, uh, Michael, Michael, please. Yeah, I would say as soon as I know they're infected, I'm, I'm going to take Or you suspect. You don't know because you don't have a cultures, but. Yeah. yeah. If I suspect they're infected, if I really think that they're infected, I'm going to take them to the OR right then. I'm going to get in, uh, additional cultures. You know, it, yeah, I, I, we're usually going to put, if we're putting in a spacer, we're going to put in high-dose antibiotics. If something changes, I think doing a double dare is, is fine. Um, or you know, you've got somebody that um, is draining and then you find out they have MRSA, you think they're a bad host. I wouldn't, ha you know, I think you can have that discussion with the patient about saying, geez, I think you really need a two-stage exchange and then go back and do that. But I'd really rather not give that biofilm any more time to, to set up. I, I would say another way, time is of the urgency. So if you have a cell count differential concerning, I will take it that night. And if I <clears throat> come back with an MRC or something else, I'll deal with that, whether it's a repeat irrigation debridement or I decide to do a two-stage. But I will prioritize time over knowing the culture. Maybe, Matt, a quick question for Ray for, or Michael. If you're going to do a DARE, what do you guys do about biofilm treatment? Meaning, what are you doing at the time of the operation with the retained implants? Are you using any detergents? Are you scrubbing with a betadine lap sponge against the retained implants? You just washing out with a, with a water hose? What are you doing about the biofilm you're blowing? That was your question because I saw you sit down. So let's just run down the panel real quick. Scrub brush, yes or no, and what irrigant? Real quick. I'm going to scrub and with betadine. So you use a sterile scrub brush and then yep. he uses betadine, okay? Yeah, I mean, I, I use like a salt or, I mean, a lap sponge, but it, it's not perfect. Okay, any irrigants? Yeah, I use, I use betadine in a ton of saline. Okay, Raph. Yeah, uh, I don't, I just change the modular implants and nine liters of normal saline. I don't use any irrigants other okay. than that. And I mean, I think that's important to say that the data does not support the use of any irrigation other than water. Okay, Kevin. Uh, scrub brush and normal saline. Rob, I you. had no idea. That's why I asked the question. That's I good. Had no idea. That's good. Uh, I, let me let me say one thing. The key is actually the debridement. Okay. So the key is an aggressive debridement. Then you'll scrape whatever you can, irrigants as appropriate, and the IV antibiotics. But the real key is a debridement, an aggressive debridement. Well, because the irrigants, you know, are effective on planktonic bacteria, right, in planktonic state. But once the, you've got the biofilm, they, the irrigants, irrigation does not help. Yep. So again, the key is going to be your debridement because you can get that layer off of there and then metal, unless you're taking them out, right, it's going to be hard to scrape. Go ahead. Well, I've got two questions. Number one is in a dare and a hip, uh, do you always change the poly out? Number two is uh, when do you retain the prostatic in case you do an implantation? You know, I mean, what are the circumstances where you leave it in 
Uh, Destination spacer, you're saying. Okay, let's do the first one because you ask an honest question. So sometimes it's a tough case. You don't have all the exposure to remove the polyethylene. You say, I'm going to do a lot more damage to take out this polyethylene. Down the panel here, anybody leave them or the attempt is always to do a modular junction exchange. Rob, let's start with you. Yeah, you can't get the poly out. So if you've got a cemented poly into a, a component, you know that's hard to get that. You can get it out, of course, but uh, I'd probably leave that poly in. You're doing a you know, suboptimal operation anyway. But often you take, if it's a modular poly, I'm usually taking it out. Because if you look at the back of that poly, there's muck back there. Look at the screw holes, there's muck. I'll take a burr into the empty screw hole. So I take it out if it's easily removed, if it's removable. But if it's not removable, of course, then you pro con to leave it in place. So I take out most of them. It's Kevin? Yeah, I'm the same as Rob, but I, I would just make the comment that there's very good data that the modular interfaces have higher colony forming units than non-modular interfaces. So I think there's good data to support taking out the modular interface if you can. Okay. Any other, any different, different anything different otherwise? And then the second question, a question on destination spaces. We have about three minutes here. Tad, why don't you take that one, please? Yeah, I mean, super fast. I would just say, I think the so-called destination spacer, you need to, you know, if you get them infection free, and they have a mechanically intact articulating spacer, now they basically have a hip replacement. So the indications to revise them are identical. So it's gonna be, you know, pain, of course, and then even if they're not having much pain, if you've got loosening with progressive bone loss, you need to pull the plug before it gets worse. And so I think the key to the longer term spacers is very careful follow up. You need to follow them radiographically, you need to follow them clinically, and every time it's a discussion about, you gotta call me if you're starting to have symptoms. Yeah, I, would, right. I would just add that if you if you have in your mind that you may want to do a destination spacer on a patient, I think it probably makes more sense to think about a one-stage exchange with high-dose antibiotics. So not prophylactic antibiotics, but true high-dose antibiotics, and then give the patient the best hip replacement you can give them or knee replacement. Yep. And I, what I would say is we've published data on this. It's actually the success rate of destination spacers is very low due to infection and mechanical failures. So doing a half-tailed job on the infection part or the fixation part is not a great compromise. So either do it that you're going to keep it or do it that you're going to exchange it. So there's been a couple of papers now showing that. We're going to take one last question here from Cody Wiles, and then i got to transition to Dr. Barry's session right after. Thanks. Um, two questions. So current I said one question from Cody Wiles here. related there. <laughs> um, current thoughts on IO vancomycin for either DARE or Good question. one stage, and then volume of irrigant. Uh, you still snuck it in there. I got you. <laughs> if you look okay, at the UK data. vancomycin. Anybody yeah, in this sure. panel doing it? So I would no. say that, you know, that was in the final consideration slide that I had. I think that the data does support that potentially the use for knees, IO intraosseo vancomycin does help with an improved, I would say, uh, eradication or control of infection. I think in, your, in the paper from Ortho Carolina was 93%, which is really high and the highest for any type of dare. They also compared it to the use of intraosseous vancomycin for chronic infections in dare, and that did not show much of an improvement with about 45% success. So again, probably a good option to include in some patients undergoing dare. Yep, good. And real quick on leaders, just give me the number. How many leaders on infected case? Real quick down the line, we got to move. Michael. Uh, one and a half leaders for the betadine and then nine liters of normal. Nine liters? Saline. Same. Nine liters? Ref? Somewhat like nine liters. Some, yeah, whatever they give you, okay? Nine. Nine? Rob? A lot. A lot. Okay, good. Thank you very much to this panel here. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Great job.